kind of looks like a Yeti, but different. I can't put my finger on it. This looks different somehow. Mm. Like the paint's a little off or something. Time for another bike build. As if you haven't seen enough of these. Tips or water, don't worry. It's like seven in the morning. My name's Nate. You might know me from uh, the internet. I make a video every week called Fall Camp Friday. Sometimes I do bike builds. And I'm not gonna lie, this is kind of a special one because this is a non turquoise Yeti. And they're calling this cherry. And I was gonna do this video and eat a bunch of cherries. And then I decided that I was gonna poop my pants, so I kind of scrapped that idea. And all I have that's red is this pepper with no flavor, because it's a baby bell pepper. <clears throat> not, even, not even interesting. So yeah, this is my new SB135. This is a direct replacement this year for the SB140. Um, I had an SB5 before that, had a bunch of time with my 140, and I eventually turned that bike from a trail bike into a slope bike, basically. And I'm going to do the same thing with my 135. Yeti kind of threw this bike out there recently as a 27.5, um, a double wheel 27.5 alternative to people who might not want a 29er trail bike or they might want to make it into a slow bike, or they can make it a mullet, or you can kind of do whatever you want to this bike. But me personally, this is going to be my old man slope bike, because I'm pretty old at this point. Um, you could call it a slalom bike. It's my dirt jumper. I'll take you through sort of the build process. You might even get to see me ride it this time. Just to take you briefly through this, basically, um, as a slope bike, I'm going to set this up with a 150 Lyric. Um, I have paired it with a Super Deluxe Ultimate for my suspension needs. As a bike that's going to hit big jumps and take big impacts, I'm just going to put a bunch of air pressure, close all the knobs, and give her hell. And that's pretty much what feels good to me when I am jumping this thing, where stiffness uh, is a priority and it's small bump doesn't actually matter. So yeah, you pretty much put in a little bit too much air, turn up all the knobs, all the dials into non-party mode, and then you're kind of where you want to be. This new SB135 frame, um, which is carried through the whole Yeti line, has all these refinements over their previous generation frames. Um, all the cable management was super tidy. There was a lot of noise damping situations right here on the chain stay to keep the chain slapped down. Uh, this thing has a UDH hanger, which, strangely enough, I am going to be using again, even though I said I'd never run a hanger again after my last transmission build on 160. But for this bike, I'm going to run a hanger. Yeah, just all the cable captures are super tight. Everything stays quiet, like when the frame vibrates, you can't, you can't hear the cables, anything like that. Um, all of the <coughs> bearings are pressed into the linkage now. And then the axle goes through that, so everything's like really stiff and rigid, and there's no flex, and everything kind of moves in a straight line and feels real buttery when you ride it. I've been super impressed with the 140 and the 160 using the new design, and everything feels great. So I'm sure this one's gonna feel the same. It's got a thread and bottom bracket. I finally got a tool so I can install it. Yeah, I guess the beauty of this bike is you can kind of do whatever you want with it. Um, Yeti has a slogan that says, new rules apply. I don't know what that means, but basically you can do whatever the hell you want with this bike. Uh, it's kind of like a more nimble play bike thing. So I think people will build them up as trail bikes for smaller people. I think people will try to mount this thing and have a big front wheel on it rather as a trail bike. I think a lot of people, a lot of the athletes for Yeti will turn these into like their mini park bikes. Before we get started, I'm going to get the meat levels right. Mmm. Salt. You don't want to bonk when you're doing a bike build. And when it's too early in the morning to drink beer, it's got to eat meat.
I'm pretty fortunate to live really close to some of the best public uh, dirt jump and slope style trails uh, in Colorado. So I pretty much ride in Frisco almost every afternoon uh, for sunset sessions if I'm in town. So this bike is perfect for being able to like ride the tech dirt jump lines, but also push up the hill and ride some of the bigger slope style jumps without dying. So as an old guy, like I could build up a hardtail and jump that, like the new DJ that's like a special project situation. It looks really sweet, but honestly, um, this would be more versatile for me as far as like being able to hit every feature without huge impacts and killing myself basically. And when I fuck up, it'll save me basically. This bike is quite the departure from all the current technology that's going on with drivetrain, uh, that sort of thing. Um, it just when SRAM comes out with a, their transmission and eliminates the need for a derailleur hanger, I'm completely going backwards in time and I'm going to run this uh, seven speed. Yeah, I mean, I could run this thing single speed too, but we'll put some gears on there in case I want to jump into a slalom race or do something like that. You'll notice the seat post does not go up and down. Um, I don't know how to use it. It goes in the frame and you turn that thing and it tightens it and just stays in one spot. It's really this weird concept, new new thing. I'm sure I'm gonna get on the bike and first thing I'm gonna do is sit down and then stand up and then swing and miss on my dropper button and then do it again. And I'll do it like 500 times before my brain's like, stop hitting your dropper post, moron. Analog seat post, seven speed, suspension that doesn't move, 60 pounds in your tires. It's like, yeah, dirt jump bike, right? Oh God, I know people want to see this beautiful body bracket just threading into the frame. In my last build, I, I used this, last couple builds, and this honestly works just fine, but now I actually have the official SRAM dub bottom bracket wrench. Oh yeah, it's probably not the right torques to the back, but that's okay. The only thing I really pay attention to with, with torque spec is my carbon handlebars. Because if you ever torque those, they can go snappy. No one wants to go snappy. Maybe if I close all the knobs and then really, and then really hit it. Black tube. You don't like pickles? I want to get the ones with the little habanero pieces in them. <laughs> when I asked for this fork from Rock Shacks, they were like, you want a 275 fork? 275's dead. No, 27.5 is not dead. 26 is kind of dead. Unless you're really building a dirt jumper. I like the little bike. It's agile. It's not fast in certain situations. It's really fun. I guess it depends on why you ride bikes. I like to have fun. I have plenty of trail bikes that go really fast with big wheels. So it didn't really make sense to build this into a trail bike. But as a jump bike, slope bike, a slalom bike, this thing will be sick. Someone commented in my last bike build that I should stop messing around with a hacksaw and get a pipe cutter because it's way easier. And I was like, wow, that's a good idea. So I went to the store and bought one. And it was like, you know, pretty cheap, whatever, 20 bucks. And then I went through my toolbox and I already had one because I used to cut them back in the day with pipe cutters. It had been so long that I actually, I actually forgot that I used to do it that way. My brain doesn't work sometimes and I've been wasting all this energy with a hacksaw. Bye bye. Bye. I have a recycling bin for my metal.
Big workout, big job. So on my last uh, slow bike, I did have a 160 Zeb on my 140. So this is a 135 and I've paired it with a 150 Lyric. I think I'll put the geometry right kind of where you want to be. Um, it's about 65 and a half with a 150 fork. There we go. I'm gonna put a 40 mil stem on this bike. That's normally what I would run on all my bikes anymore because this feels weird if you don't have a short stem to me. Get aggressive with it. Put it on there. Okay. Of course, you gotta have that that bougie Yeti top cap. As far as bars go, um, same carbon bar that I run on all the bikes, just so things feel normal. Um, this is a 760 wide tributed descendant bar. Some people are worried about carbon bars. The only bar I've ever broken in my life was aluminum, and that was in a race run back when I used to race downhill. And I actually snapped both sides off and hit my sternum on my stem and tomahawk through a rock garden. And it was completely fine. And the spectators grew very quiet as that happened. And then they cheered when I stood up. It was kind of, uh, kind of uh, left a mark on me, literally. After that happened, I obviously couldn't race anymore because my handlebars weren't connected to my bike. So I rode to the bottom of Angel Fire with one hand on my stem and one hand using my broken bar, my back brake, off to the side. And I can say that I never got worse arm pump in my life as riding that last 500 vertical feet to the bottom of Angel Fire. But at least I didn't die or get hurt, so yeah. Cool story, Ned. These bars do have handy little centering marks to make that nice and easy. I do run them a hair rolled forward. Some would call that Chicago. I don't know where that comes from, but that's always what I called it since I was a little kid. But I've always liked my bars rolled just a hair forward. Especially on a bike where all you do is yank off lips. For whatever reason, I like the angle of the dangle with Chicago. And as we spoke earlier, I don't use a torque wrench on everything, but something I am pretty anal about is always torquing your carbon bars correctly. Because we already have the handlebar snapping situation story and my aluminum bars that broke may or may not have been torqued properly. That was so long ago, I can't remember. Maybe I didn't even know what a torque wrench was back then. So my favorite grip from Ergon as of late is the GFR1. It's for free riding. I guess you could call that what I'm doing with this bike, more or less. Um, I like these things because they have these ribs underneath and when they're oriented like that and you're hanging on the bars, you can actually feel those little guys under there. So, I don't know, just personal preference. Um, I like the way they feel when I hang on to them. So while we're talking about Ergon, uh, I am gonna run their downhill saddle on this bike. This one has tie rails. Still drinking this awful hipster water. Instead of eating cherries, I'm drinking black cherry hipster water. I can't wait until 20 years from now when people are like, oh, it's a, the natural denotation actually kills you. You can just call it anything natural and people think it's good for you, but whatever weird shit they're putting in this to make it taste like black cherry, can't be good for you. Sorry. And a rant. Uh. All right, now shit's gonna get really weird. Do you remember this? It's a seven speed derailleur. Uh, how many gears do our trail bikes use now? I can't even remember there's so many. Seven speed, wow. Technology's amazing. It goes on a derailleur hanger. Look, there's a derailleur hanger on this bike. Who would have thought that these things would still be used? Well, until SRAM makes a UDH frame mount transmission situation like I have on my sweet trail bike, I guess I'll be running this old school seven speed screw on thing that goes in this weird like hook down here. Uh, I'm gonna pair it with a, with a 10 speed chain. When's the last time you saw one of those? Weird, right? What is this? Is this a cable? Where's the battery? Seven speeds? What kind of peasant shit is this? Seven speeds? Come on. Come on, SRAM. How do you get the cable back there? 
Oh. They, they put the dust off this. It's been so long since I've used it. Look how dirty my hand is. I think this is how you install a derailleur. It doesn't have a battery. I'm definitely gonna need a beer for this. The dentist will be so unimpressed with this seven speed. Huh. And as I always use, I put my finger there. That's the right spacing. I found this time capsule in my garage. I think these go on the end of the cable. I think they call them cable ends. Uh, it took me like an hour, but I found these shift ferrules. Ferrules? I think these go on the end of the this cable. And this must go through the that thing. Ferrules. Ugh. I don't even know anymore. Oh, look, it came out here. Weird. I always wonder what that was for. Ah, look at that. This is a different way to do stuff. All cable jokes aside, this is actually pretty sweet, Yeti. Good job. Boop. Nice and tight, and it's not gonna rub on my cherry. And that also holds it tight, and nothing's gonna make any noise. Except for me. Wee! Weird. Look at this thing. I found this thing in my toolbox. It's so strange. I don't know what you do with this. Seems like a weird technique to me. I don't know why anyone would ever use some archaic shit like this. I'll use this again someday. I seem to remember that back when I used to run cables, I used to do this with my awl. Is that an awl? And then, when you stick the, when you ram it in there, it doesn't get all hung up. Spit on it, put it in there. Can you imagine having to replace this contraption? What a pain in the ass. Pretzel insertion. Already feels biny and shitty. You wonder why you died, Cable. You wonder why you went away. Hmm. Back in time we go. Very peasant, very peasant. I will be running a chain guide on this bike and every bike I own always every time, no matter what. Uh, this is a new MRP uh, AMG SL. Um, basically just a little bit newly designed top mount situation. This is actually really cool. It eliminates the need for spacers in the back. Well, that's not how it goes. This slides in and out and then you can get your chain spacing perfectly and then tighten it down and you're good. So no more like trying to get a spacer in here and fumbling and throwing shit around your garage. So good, good MRP for figuring that out because that's actually, that's actually super rad. Never go out in public with that guide. Oh, come on. I am going to run a 170 millimeter crank. It says it right here so I know. Dub, wide. I'm going to run a 36. The spec is 34. You're not supposed to run a 36 so this is going to void my warranty, but I don't care. Oh no. Killing it. Torque this to spec. Click. That's great. That's just great. And again, the beauty of this chain guide is that you take your tube mill and then you can center your top mount side to side. You probably can't see that from way over there, but... And then tighten it down, eliminating the need for faffing around with spacers behind the back plate. So there you go. For brakes, I am going to run a SRAM code RSCs on here. Typical slope style bike, maybe people would only run a rear brake and they wouldn't have a shifter situation and then they could do bar spins, but I'm old, I don't do bar spins, so I'm just gonna run normal brake setup through here. Um, I'm gonna run a front brake, I'm gonna run two brakes on this bike in case I wanna jump into a slalom race or something like that. Um, and I'm old and sometimes front brake is sweet. You can stop faster and not have to go to the hospital type stuff. So I'm gonna run 180 front and rear just cause I don't need a whole lot of stopping power on this bike. I just need to like avoid dying real quick. I'm gonna run metallic pads. I'm gonna run these new HS2 rotors, which are a little bit thicker and they, man, they just feel so much better than the last gen to me. I'm gonna say I'm not wearing gloves. That is not your best your best bet for a positive outcome, but since I don't do this for a living every day, I'll probably be okay with a little bit of brake fluid in my body. 
all the little cable captures. Do a magnificent job to make the routing as simple as possible because anyone who's spent snipping time fighting cable routing can attest to the fact that that's the least favorite part of building a bike. Come on, buddy. I'm doing it from the backside. Damn, she clean. I used to put some heat shrink over this stuff, but clearly I've forgotten to do that at this juncture, so I'm gonna zip tie it. Remember those? One of these two hickeys. I'm gonna use this miniature wrench so that you cannot over tighten it. I like grease. I like some grease. I think you're supposed to use special grease for that, but I don't have any of the grease that's compatible with brake fluid, so I just use saran butter. Brake tacks are cringing currently. You'll notice I am not using a torque wrench for this. The only advice I can give you is that when it stops turning, it's tight. Boop. Can you tell I'm building this in a rush because I want to go ride it? Story of my bike building career. Thanks to the miracle of the internet, uh, front brake's installed. You didn't need to watch me do that twice. Anyway, always wear your gloves. I don't wear them when I ride. I don't wear them when I lead brakes. Breaking all the rules. On this bike, like all the bikes, I'm running Zip 30 Moto wheels. I am going to run about 60 pounds in my tires, so that's gonna make everything extra stiff. The wheels don't matter hugely, but these are nice, super nice wheels. Um, they're better suited to the trail bike, honestly, but they'll be great in this application with the super high uh, pressure in the tire. I'm gonna run something a little more narrow back, like a, uh, like a two, three, five, and I'm gonna run a two, four uh, ish tire in the front. And yeah, I usually run like 50 in the front, 60 in the rear, and we're good. Pro proper dirt jump pressures. Yeah, seven speed going on here. So strange. I should probably leave that first because I'll leave everything. It's good all over yourself. It's one of those things where you just can't have enough lube on your stuff. Seven speed. That goes on here. He's going the holes. And you pull this trigger to you strip everything. Leave your axle. Don't make me tell you again. Just when you thought you had to have a 29er. Oh, there's grease everywhere. Love it. Lubrication. Oh, yeah. You'll notice I'm not running a water bottle on this bike because the BMX guys make fun of me enough for riding steep dirt jumps on a mountain bike. So I'm just gonna take that awkwardness out of the equation, even though people like water so much. After working with the new SRAM transmission, I've completely forgot how to set up a derailleur. My brain is just not what it used to be for this sort of technical maneuver. Oh, sketch. Well, If you wonder why I'm not drinking beer or tequila or something, and instead eating this sandwich, it's because I'm actually gonna go deer jumping and I don't wanna be drunk at the trails and hurt myself. Kids, don't drink at the trails. Eat sandwiches. This is pepperoni and Swiss on sourdough baguette, which are good. I'm gonna talk with my mouthful. Here, I'm gonna put um, 420 pounds in. I'll throw a few extra, a few extra PSIs in here. Same in the front. The sag doesn't really matter quite as much when you're hitting actual dirt jumps, despite what the internet might tell you. Wow, it's so light. Always remember, do not over tighten your brake levers because when you crash, you want your brake lever to go like that. When I set up the front end, I like to look down through my handlebars and look at the tops of the fork crown to get it straight because with all these cables and all this weird shit going on here, 
It's like a puzzle. Now we'll know we set this up right if this barely moves. That's it. Kind of what we're looking for. It should bounce. Holy crap. Let's go to the trails. Thank you for watching. Uh, if you made it this far, give yourself a raise or perhaps have a sandwich. Don't ride drunk. Don't ride drunk, kids. Just eat a sandwich. There's a pork chop in every beer and there's a sandwich in every sandwich. So, yep. Thanks for watching. Um, let me know if you have any questions. I'm sure I left out half of the important details that you might be concerned about with a bike build of this caliber. Let me know in the comments what I should have done. Let me know what you think of this cherry color. It really looks pretty sweet with all the all the black bits on there, pretty rad, honestly. And yeah, thanks to my partners for making this possible. To be fully transparent, um, I'm a professional athlete. I work with all these companies. Um, this stuff's all given to me. It's what I would choose to put on my bikes anyway, but just want to throw it out there that uh, I work with these guys. Big thanks to SRAM, RockShock, Zip, Ergon, of course, UD Cycles. Bye for making this stuff possible and putting sandwiches on my table to eat. First episode of Fall Camp Friday dropping every Friday at 10 a.m. I'm headed to Canada next week to race Trans BC. We'll get some footage coming from that. And in the meantime, I'll be at the local trails hitting dirt jumps until I get buckled. Um, thanks to the jump doctors for making Frisco wicked sweet for so long now. Pretty fortunate to have rad trails to ride. Pretty much the reason I built this bike. Yep, come on and check out the trails in Frisco. Let me know if you have any weird comments or questions. Like that smash sandwich. Thanks for watching. Cheers. Oh, if you need any of these parts, go see my homies at Worldwide Cyclery. They're the best. Spend all your hard-earned pesos with that, because they know what's up.